Well, I mean, just first of all, can you can you introduce yourself and share um, a bit about the work that you do with Plowshares and how it relates to taking a social justice um, and human rights driven approach to Canadian foreign policy? Absolutely. Uh, and thanks for, for having me with you today. So I'm Cesar Jaramillo. I'm the executive director at Project Plowshares. We're based in, in Waterloo, Ontario. And for the past 45 years, we were founded in 1976 by my predecessors. And for the past 45 years, we've been working uh, primarily on, on matters of, of arms control, disarmament, and international security. And uh, a fundamental question in our work it relates to Canada's role in the world. You know, how Canada, as a middle power, can exercise its, 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 uh, its weight, its, 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 diploma, its, its diplomatic uh, capacity, uh, its influence, uh, you know, in, in various multilateral forums, et cetera, uh, for better or worse. You know, we ask the question, what is the role that, uh, that Canada is playing these days? It's, it, is it really contributing to, to building a, a, a more just, a more secure, a, most, a more peaceful world? Or, or is it the contrary? You know, is it the opposite? Is it, is, it, is, it the, is it a matter of Canada actually being sometimes at least part of the problem rather, rather than part of the solution? So, so yeah, so we assess these matters through, 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 uh, through research, through advocacy, through engagement with, with government officials in Ottawa, through engagement with other governments internationally. But yeah. uh, at the end of the day, we, we really ask the question about Canada's role in the world. Well, this brings up a, a very important treaty that uh, was uh, initiated globally in January of 2000, 2021, excuse me. Uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Arms, which I know that Plowshares had supported this treaty mm -hmm. um, and uh, other organizations. Um, so could you talk about the importance of this, this treaty and why you did support it? And also maybe the space between the rhetoric of the Liberal government, uh, because they do talk about wanting a world without nuclear weapons but there is an international treaty uh, for the prohibition of nuclear weapons that mm -hmm. many countries have signed globally that Canada has not signed. Absolutely. I mean, and this is, this is a treaty that is good news for the international community. First of all, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, it came into force, like you said correctly, in just recently in January, but it's, it's, uh, uh, to get to January, to that point when it entered into force, a lot of years of work have gone into this uh, into this effort. That Project Plowshares, we have supported the Treaty on the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons uh, from the start, since it was, since before it was negotiated, since it, since it was just a. Uh, uh, an idea of, from from progressive states and civil society groups in Canada and internationally, and basically the treaty uh, intends to fill a legal gap to address a legal anomaly, whereby every other category of weapons of mass destruction had uh, already had an explicit prohibition under international law, but nuclear weapons the most destructive of all did not have an explicit prohibition. So to give you just a couple of examples, you know, there is, there is a chemical weapons convention. There's a biological weapons convention. There is a landmines treaty, which incidentally is very closely related to Canada and the Ottawa process from, from just over 20 years ago. But once again, nuclear weapons are the most devastating instruments of mass destruction ever conceived. And they, they, they lacked an explicit prohibition under international law. So a growing number of civil society uh, groups around the world, some champion states that care about this issue a few years ago started saying, let's fix this. You know, why don't we, the, we rally the international community around this objective and try to negotiate a treaty to, to leave no ambiguity around the fact that nuclear weapons, their very possession is illegal. It, and, it's, it, and it's something that is going to strengthen international law. It's something that, that is going to pave the way for the, you know, towards their, their elimination. So that's in principle, you know, in, in very general terms, uh, the, what happened with the nuclear ban treaty. But when we started negotiating it, and I had the opportunity to attend the negotiations, and 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 it was driven to a large part, to a, to a large part by a, by a um, intentional emphasis on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, you know, and, and sort of reframing the narrative around nuclear weapons in such a way 
that the, that the impact of these weapons, the destruction that they cause on, on, on men, women, and children, on civilian lives and livelihoods, uh, on victims, not just of the weapons themselves, as in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but also of, the, of, of nuclear weapons testing that, that, you know, that has happened since uh, these weapons were used in, in, in combat um, just over 75 years ago, uh, played a very prominent role. You know, and turn this conversation really into a very visceral conversation about cancer, about burnt children, about, you know, uh, defects at birth, about multi generational harm. And this helped move the needle, really. I mean, this, this very visceral uh, 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 sort of narrative uh, founded strongly on human security, on the protection of the, on the individual, which is, you know, uh, in my view and in the view of many others, is paramount and, in fact, is more important than even national security considerations. So the, so the treaty came about in, in that context, but from the early days, we started to notice that it wasn't it was it had a lot of support but not universal support and perhaps not surprisingly states with nuclear weapons you know the, the states more uh, that would perhaps be most affected by a change in the status quo around nuclear weapons possession were very uh, strongly opposed to the treaty you know and they were dismissive they were they were uh, behind the scenes uh, sort of sort of uh, scheming to 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 try to to obfuscate the negotiations they specifically called upon their allies to boycott the negotiations and to vote against any resolution at the united nations that was related to the treaty and canada is one of those allies of nuclear weapon states primarily through its membership in nato nato the north atlantic treaty organization has both nuclear weapon states states that possess nuclear weapons and non-nuclear weapon states like Canada that do not possess nuclear weapons. However, countries like Canada, despite not possessing nuclear weapons, have actually aligned themselves with the countries that have nuclear weapons and not with the growing majority in the international community that, that is demanding concrete progress towards abolition. So Canadian policies, doctrines, and actions are very regrettably more aligned with those of the United States, for example, and its NATO partners, than with Austria, uh, than with Mexico, than with Costa Rica, than with uh, South Africa, and just a, a growing number of countries from around the world that have said, you know, enough is enough. You know, we have we have had uh, nuclear weapons for more than seven decades, and it's 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 time to get rid of this existential threat. So Canada has been, uh, from that perspective, uh, I would say, uh, and once again, very regrettably, more part of the problem than part of the solution of, of the, in terms of the pursuit of nuclear weapons free world. And so Canada, just, yeah. Just to Go underline um, the fact that uh, the liberal government in power right now in Canada has talked about being fully supportive of a world without nuclear weapons, uh, Justin Trudeau has been explicit in saying this publicly. Yes. Minister, um, and uh, has talked about the danger of nuclear arms. Um, so can you talk about how that distance between uh, the language of the Canadian government around this critically important issue for all of humanity um, uh, and the actions of the government differ? Uh, because this international treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is obviously a huge step forward. And as you mentioned, and thank you for mentioning that, this is something that didn't happen out of the blue. It was uh, uh, building for many years. Uh, many organizations internationally had supported this process um, and some governments, uh, which you also mentioned. Um, so how, how does that distance square up between the rhetoric of the government and the actions? And how does that in general, not just on the prohibition treaty around nuclear weapons, speak to the contradictions around the discourse of Canadian foreign policy and the actions? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think contradiction is, is, is the operative word here because there is a very clear contradiction and there is a, there is a gap as you said, this distance between the rhetoric and the action is it has become just too too obvious to, to to deny. 
You know, there is a clear gap between what the government says and what the government does. And, and, and this particular government actually, I, I think, is quite clever when it comes to PR and when it comes to saying the right things and, to, and, and when it comes to, to expressing support for, for lofty objectives, so, you know, that no one would argue against. But the actions tell a very different story. And I think that's where it becomes uh, really problematic. So let's take it by parts. First of all, the fact alone that the government says that it supports a world without nuclear weapons, you know, it's, it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. I, I think that virtually every government in the world, including those that possess nuclear weapons, including those that have used nuclear weapons, including those that have tested nuclear weapons, including those where, where there is a possibility of conflict involving nuclear weapons, tend to say that they support a world without nuclear weapons. You know, you won't really find a lot of evidence of governments saying that they that they want a nuclear catastrophe, that they want nuclear anni annihilation, that they want nuclear winter. So the fact alone that they say they support this this objective is not really evidence of of actual support. You know, this is like the bare minimum. This is it'd be odd to say that they were not supportive of that goal. But when Canada says it, I think it can only be taken as a distant ethereal objective. Because when it comes to its concrete actions, it's it's actually pushing in the complete in, in a completely different direction. Um, so Canada, Canada, if it meant this this purported support for nuclear weapons, you know, it would it would for one thing join the majority of the international community that that um, that uh, that have that have joined the, the the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons by by acceding to it. It would also initiate a dialogue within NATO, within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, to formulate security arrangements that do not rely on the use of these instruments of mass destruction. That that no one denies that there is a need for security arrangements. And no one denies that there is a need for strategic stability, including middle powers, including major powers, et cetera. What we're saying is take nuclear weapons out of the equation. You know, they're so destructive that they need to be taken out of the equation. And in, 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 in lieu of that nuclear sort of deterrence, uh, so-called nuclear deterrence, Canada is well positioned to initiate a dialogue at various important forums where, it, where it's a member uh, on, on new security arrangements that once again do not rely on nuclear weapons. Okay. But we're, we, we seem to be far from there. And I think the rhetoric of the Liberal government uh, uh, it may, be, may sound positive, but the actions are not so different from, from their predecessors, you know, the conservative governments. When Canada came to power, when this particular government came to power, there was a lot of talk of change, you know, that change was in the making, that change was happening, that there was a big change, you know, in, in the way of doing things compared to the, to their, the, under Harper, under, under the previous uh, conservative government. But the fact of the matter is that when it comes to foreign policy, specifically foreign policy related to arms control and disarmament, uh, there has been very little change. I think the, 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 the Canada's position vis-a-vis -vis nuclear disarmament is very similar under the, uh, under the Liberals uh, than under the Conservatives. Canada was, uh, just to mention another uh, foreign policy related file, you know, arms exports, uh, you know, to, 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 to shady regimes are, have continued under the Liberals just as they were happening under the Conservatives. So this notion, just to, to illustrate the fact that this notion of change with this government didn't really materialize when it when it comes to foreign policy and when it comes to international security policy and 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 the international community has taken notice i mean it's not just civil society activists calling out the government i think anyone who follows these multilateral processes including related to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons would would uh, would uh, place canada uh, among the problematic states and not among those that are helping out, you know, unlock this file, this thorny file of, of nuclear disarmament. And it's a shame because it's a wasted opportunity. And Canada really has, you know, some some muscle, some some credibility as, as an honest broker, these things, you know, but uh, but I think these are these these assumptions on Canada's role are, are sort of based on past glories. And don't really align with the realities today, where Canada is, is once again a, a hurdle to to progress rather than than a facilitator. Uh, thank you so much for outlining that. And you know, I would just mention that you know one of the issues you highlighted was the arms exports to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 
not Saudi Arabia specifically, but just underlining the fact that the Liberal government did uh, approve, uh, reapprove after review the arms exports to Saudi Arabia. So this sort of ties into the work at Plowshares. So yes. um, could you talk a bit and explain, please, um, what Plowshares is and how it works and how it relates to these questions? Absolutely. So we track Canadian arms exports and we, do, and we follow the international trade and conventional weapons in general. And the thing to know, first of all, about arms exports is that it's a very lucrative business. You know, there's a, there's a constant supply and there's a constant demand and, and, it's, and it's valued in, in, in tens of billions of dollars and, 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 um, and, and by some estimates, more than $100 billion every single year. So from a business perspective, you know, what's not to like, you know, it's a lucrative business and there's, there's countries like Canada that are willing to supply and there is, there's conflict zones around the world that are demanding, demanding weaponry all the time. So, you know, uh, it seems like a pretty solid business. The problem from a human rights perspective is that a significant proportion of, of these exports are actually misused. You know, and, and a significant proportion of these experts go to enable the violation of human rights. They go to sustain autocratic regimes. They go to exacerbate armed conflict. And Canada is, uh, you know, it's Canada is among those that, that, that is supplying weapons that are being misused and are among those that are supplying weapons when the risks of, of misuse are clear and present and undeniable. And despite this, Canada proceeds exporting weapons to countries such as Saudi Arabia. Now, it's not Saudi Arabia, it's not, uh, and there, there's other cases, but there's a multi-billion dollar uh, deal right now in place that, is, that has continued despite any number of red flags having been, been raised around this, this issue. Yeah. And it's not simply the opinion of Project Plowshares that Saudi Arabia is, is, is a problematic recipient. Every authoritative organization in the world that tracks human rights consistently places Saudi Arabia at the very bottom of any ranking when it comes to human rights. Uh, there is one called Freedom House uh, based in, in, in the U.S. in Washington, D.C. that has a special category called the worst of the worst. And sure enough, consistently, Saudi Arabia is at the bottom of the worst of the worst in the world. So it's an irredeemable, uh, uh, you know, a sort of recipient. And it begs the question, if a country with Saudi Arabia's abysmal human rights record is eligible to receive Canadian-made military exports, who would not be? Because they set the bar impossibly low. You know, they are violators within their borders. They, they violate the, the, of, of Shia minorities, the, of, of women, of, you know, they have harsh sentences for nonviolent offenses, all sorts of, of well-documented pattern of, of human rights violations, but also beyond their borders. In neighboring Yemen, for example, uh, they are the chief instigator of what is now called the worst humanitarian crisis of our time. And they, 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 ha they are leading a military intervention. And there have been reports by authoritative uh, uh, groups, uh, or including from, from the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, and a group of eminent experts on Yemen that have uh, squarely placed the blame on countries like Canada and the United Kingdom and the United States and others for facilitating the, uh, the, the conflict. So Canada has washed its hands and said, that, well, this government, I mean, there's been a, a bit of a blame game because the current government says that the deal was negotiated initially sure. by the previous government. Sure. But, uh, but, but in reality, the key element for these sorts of deals to proceed, I don't want to get too technical, but the key element is something called an export permit. And I think it's important to understand that every single export yeah. permit related to this deal has been approved under this government under the under yes. the liberal government so so they have to own this own this and um and and, and yeah and i think canadian citizens and, and and people here in in the country need to understand that that our country is not just facilitator but given the 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 the, the, the evidence about the risk of misuse in saudi arabia and beyond its borders i think one can start talking about canadian complicity in some of the, in some of the, the, the you know, the, these instances of misuse in Saudi Arabia and in Yemen, because we know well what is happening, and despite that risk, we are exporting. So there is a situation of willful blindness here, uh, uh, for sure. So the name of your organization, uh, Plowshares, um, 
uh, if you could just explain a bit sure. how it works, because I think it's a really interesting project that's existed for a long time. So shares, of course, speaks to right. uh, financial um, it, sort of shares that people would have within your organization. Um, could you just very quickly explain for people who aren't familiar with Plowshares what it Absolutely. is? Absolutely. So this is, I mean, as I said, uh, you know, we were founded 45 years ago by, by two two well-known uh, peace activists in Canada, Erin Regeer, who's still uh, based here in Waterloo, and Marie Thompson, who has since uh, passed away. And uh, the name came actually from a biblical uh, reference. There's a biblical reference that speaks of beating swords into plowshares. And this is a well-known metaphor for, for uh, a better allocation of resources for, you know, so going from swords, you know, militarism, uh, weaponry, all of these things to plowshares, agriculture, you know, and the image that it, that evokes is it speaks to what we do, you know, sort of sort of uh, uh, having a better priorities, having uh, having a better allocation of resources, moving away from 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 the sort of almost instinctive uh, inclination to resort to military solutions for every conceivable problem, and and, and rather you know try to invest those resources in dipl in diplomacy and in 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 development and in, uh, in, 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 yeah, in, in other more peaceful ventures. And we have all of our programs related to, in one way or another to disarmament and, and, and arms control. So we, we follow nuclear disarmament, we follow the, the arms trade, we're, we're, we follow uh, emerging military technologies, sort of the future of warfare, what that might look like and what regulations might be in place. So, so, so we follow, for instance, the security of outer space systems and whether that can become a, a, an arena for military confrontation. Sure, we follow sure. uh, artificial intelligence and how that is, that is fueling new military uh, um, uh, sort of innovations and, sure. and, and this prospect of killer robots or, or, or lethal autonomous weapon systems that are maybe around the corner, depending on, on, on how you formulate it. So, so in general, yeah, we, we, we believe, we believe uh, strongly in norms, in the power of norms. And, and how we can uh, we can shape norms and uh, you know at the and the domestic at, at the international level and how they the, those can constitute sort of effective constraints uh, on governments uh, through regulations and importantly we believe in the power of advocacy from civil society you know from everyday individuals like you and me and your listeners and you know people who care enough about an issue to to act and and you know right. even the word activist which i'm sure everybody has heard uh, there's no mystery there you know an activist is so, simply somebody who acts somebody who cares about about an issue to take action and we have seen uh, there's many problems still to be solved but there's also some good news stories and some small victories along the way so we have seen that that when people uh are well informed and care about the issue and take action, they can indeed shape some of the norms. They can indeed influence decision makers, whether in Ottawa or at the United Nations in New York or Vienna sure. or Geneva. And there is such a thing as, as people power, not to sound too esoteric, but there is such a thing as influence. I can, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, which I'm a proud member of and which, which was instrumental to the negotiation of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, I think is a prime example of this. You know, this is a civil society at its best right, from, you know, people from, from, from Africa and from Europe and from Latin, Latin America and North America and Asia and everywhere, all with this, with this preoccupation around nuclear weapons coming together to you know to push for the for the for the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons to be negotiated to and now that it since it has been negotiated to push for more and more countries to join it and to come in so it's it's um yeah it's really a, a story about the you know people not resting on their laurels people not staying home you know sort of uh, whining and complaining and doing nothing about it but 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 quite the contrary you know people sure. actually taking action going where the action is putting on our, our suits and ties and, and or whatever you care to however you care to dress and going to the un and speaking their language and learning their methods and going there and engaging and 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 trying to really trying to really change reality and that is central for, for, for not just for Project Plowshares, but I believe for, for civil society groups more generally, the fact that, um, and this may really sound grandiose or, or ambitious, but we want to change the world. 
I mean, we don't just want to describe it. We don't just want to, and this may be a difference with perhaps academia or other sectors that, that, that do research on these files. We don't just want to say the US has this many nuclear weapons and Russia has this many nuclear weapons and France and, 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 and China and the United Kingdom, period. Uh, we do that, but we also say, what are we gonna do about it? Got it. You know, it's not just about being descriptive. It's about being revolutionary, in a, you know, in a positive sense. How are we going to change the world? And, and I think in our case, the driver really is to reduce human suffering. It's not to be, a, you know, to be a, to throw a wrench at the government or to, to score a point for, for, you know, for the sake of scoring a point. Really, it's about reducing human suffering because we believe there are many instances of preventable human suffering that are occurring and, or threats to uh, like, no, you know, the lingering threat of nuclear weapons. And, we, you know, we can't just do nothing about it. So we try yeah. to affect change in, 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 yeah, in various ways. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing a bit about your work uh, at Plowshares uh, project, but also to speak about these key issues of arms exports from Canada uh, to governments that violate human rights and the importance of the global treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So thank you so much for, for speaking to us today uh, for this series of interviews uh, that I've been working on uh, in collaboration with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Estefan. Pleasure to be with you.